Welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing? Having a good conference so far? All right. So in this talk, I'm going to tell a lot of little stories about ways my kids have either taken an existing program and customized it, and then eventually learned to build their own programs. I don't know how general these lessons are. I hope to, that some of them are. But I hope at least they'll be entertaining. So I have a five-year-old and a 12-year-old. And uh, each with, of course, an awesome skill set and set of interests. And neither one of their sets of interests are particularly geared toward computer programming. Neither one of them, I don't think, is going to be interested in pursuing it as a career. But I still love watching them learn to program, because I think it's going to be really useful for them no matter what career they go into. So uh, why, do, why do I want them to, to, to learn to program? I mean, there, there are a lot of reasons. Now, the, the expected answer is that, well, we need, we need more programmers. But I'm not necessarily trying to make them into programmers. You know, we need, we need more scientists. We need more people who understand science, technology, engineering, math, is that big STEM acronym. And this is all true, right? Every other uh, issue of communications, the ACM's got an article, we need more STEM students. We need more women in STEM. These things are all true. It would uh, just tickle me pink if they ended up going and being in the sciences. But that's not really why I enjoy programming with them. Really, what I would like them to learn is computational thinking. That ability to, to, to take a big problem and break it down into pieces and say, here's what I have, there's where I want to get, what are the steps to get there? Because computational thinking is a very close cousin of critical thinking. <laughs> this is what we really, really need more of in the world. But something that delighted me in this is that I noticed that they're also becoming problem solvers. I like solving things just for the fun of cracking open a puzzle, and I think they do too. But it's even cooler when they use these techniques to solve a real life problem that they have. And we'll see a couple of examples where they do that too. I'm not trying to get too utilitarian about this and insist that everything has to have a practical purpose. But it's, it's nice when a plan comes together. <laughs> so a lot of the typical toolkits for teaching beginner programmers tend to fall into one of two big approaches. You're either given something like a full-fledged programming environment and uh, like a wall of text. Here's the, here's the syntax manual. Go. Or you're given a wall of tools. Here's this big palette of tools that you can visually uh, click together. And there are other approaches than these. Both of these can be made to work. They each have some trade-offs that I'd like to talk about. And so we'll do this kind of chronologically. We'll talk about the first program that Daughter the Elder worked on. So this was when she was in second grade, and, and it was a program written in shoes, the Ruby toolkit designed for very quickly and easily throwing a GUI together. This is not designed for beginner programmers. So when I pick on it here, I'm not actually picking on it uh, on any perceived failings of it as a tool for beginner programmers. This is just what we had at the time. And by the way, uh, we're not going to cover all the tools out there in this talk. Uh, I'm sure some of you are going to have questions in your mind. Well, have you tried Alice? Have you tried IPython? Um, the answer is maybe. I'd love to hear about what tools that, that you've heard about. And feel free to bring them up at any time or after the talk. So Shoes is designed to very quickly throw together GUIs. And there was even a little Shoebox hosting site where you could quickly post your scripts. And uh, Daughter the Elder, when she was in second grade, had spelling quizzes every Friday. And they were verbal. So it wasn't the kind of thing where you could do something on, on paper and uh, you know, check your answer and look at it, or, or a, a form that you fill out and it tells you true or false, because you're, she's supposed to spell it out loud. So we said, well, let's put together this little tool for her to um, let the computer speak a word to her, and then she will spell it out loud and then check her answer afterwards. And of course, we practice with her too, but the computer doesn't get tired as quickly as we do. So I wrote the basic skeleton of the app. This was her first exposure to programming. I didn't expect her to go write a full-fledged programming. I wanted her to start with customizing something that was already there. So Shoes, you can see, has this sort of HTML-like box model thing going on, where you've got a header, and it just shows up on this vertical stack of divs. And you've got a flow, which then becomes like a div with a bunch of spans in it. And this is all well and good. Now, you can see why I didn't want to have her jump in and write that herself, because right off the bat, we've got a never-before-seen programming language syntax. You've got to explain do and end. You've got to explain um, 
the at signs in Ruby or whatever syntax language features your language has. Um, and we've got to talk about variables, which are very different from the variables she's going to encounter in algebra soon, uh, where you, you say ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, and then you start solving it and moving things around, and x never changes. These variables are getting written to and changed all the time. That's, that's different. And of course, anytime you introduce loops and conditionals, you've got to explain that. That's a lot to take on all at once. And then you add in this HTML-like box model. I mean, forget it. We've got to start somewhere. So again, I put together the, the program, and then I said, OK, well, let me walk you through and explain how it works. And then next week, when you get your words, I want you to go in and customize and say, OK, up, update this list of words. And, and by the way, Marcus, in your talk this morning, you mentioned every code example that you've ever <laughs> have you seen at uh, this or any other conference has bugs on it. I can see a, a scripting injection bug uh, here <laughs> at, uh, at, at the very least. There may be more. But uh, <laughs> yes, well, she doesn't have the root password, but she could very easily open a terminal and type in anything anyway. So, so this is where it starts. This is not programming, but this is one step toward it, right? This is that gateway drug uh, to, to get started. And there is that blurry line between programming languages and customization languages. Like, look at Lua. Look at half the game industry and Adobe Lightroom, right? There's, there's that line where customizing something ends and creating something new begins. And th this is that line that we're surfing. And by the way, when you see these slides with this very snazzy key logo, this is something that I realized and thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's take a step back and think about that. Some of these things may be old news to you all. Uh, and if that's the case, just, just pretend all these slides have like this on them instead, right? Sudden, sudden clarity clearance. So let's move on from the wall of text to the next little story. She, uh, the next project that she worked on was with one of these wall of tools style apps, and it's called Scratch. Is anybody familiar with Scratch? Yeah, everybody, cool. So it's designed at, uh, at MIT as a way of creating interactive animations. And you can, you can make them accept user input. You could write a full-fledged game in here. Many people do. But it really is geared toward creating animations and characters on a stage that play off of each other. And this is what it looks like. So you create a scene. This is the, where the main body of the program executes. And each character in the scene is an actor or a sprite in, in scratch parlance. And each actor gets their own script. So this actor's script is right here. We'll zoom in in a minute. And that governs their behavior. And it's kind of neat. It's sort of like multitasking for free. They don't really have to learn threading APIs to spin up new threads. You just create an actor. However, there is this big box of tools out here. I count about 12 in the left column-ish. Plus, we're not scrolled all the way down. Plus, there are seven other categories. So it, it's very easy to know where things go. They just kind of plug into each other. And things that are shaped like numbers have numbers in them. So syntax errors become kind of impossible. But it's hard to know where to start. There's just such a big palette there. This is what my daughters tend to make with, uh, with Scratch. I, the only ones. Yeah. yeah, I know. I, 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 didn't, uh, I don't have any movies of those for you. Uh, if, if, uh, if you really want to see a, a clam wearing a, a bow and pooping, um, come to me after. They're all on my laptop. But I, I did capture a movie of uh, a dinosaur in an airplane that my five-year-old made when she was about three or four. It happened at bar camp. Uh, it was either last year or the year before. And uh, it w it's a movie that she and a couple of other kids worked on together. And it's really simple. It lasts all of three seconds. Actually, I should uh, turn the volume up. OK, I don't know if you can hear that, but, but it, went, it went rawr at the end. It's not. It's not a web browser. It's not, it's not an operating system. But, but by golly, they sat down there and they wrote that program together without really much intervention from the adults. And here, here's the program. So it took a little training at first to explain, like, basically, you start the program by clicking a little green flag. So they know they need this one in here. Um, you, you'll see a lot of Cartesian coordinates. And they didn't have to deal with that at all, because Scratch is really nice. When you drag the airplane to its starting position, and then you go grab this go-to, 
it's pre-filled in with the current coordinates of where it's at. So the, the kid just thinks it is like, go to where I am right now. And they, cl they click into play sound, and they click record, and they start talking and going rawr, and, zhoom, and all their sound effects, and it just gets recorded in there. And then the dinosaur waits for the airplane to, to finish flying overhead so that he can freely roar. So meanwhile, uh, Daughter the Elder was working on Scratch stuff too. And she's done cool animations with you know, exploding soccer balls and things like that. But the thing that I thought was really cool was, again, going back to schoolwork, uh, a couple years later, they're working on basic multiplication facts, the memorization, those uh, 1 through 10 uh, tables that you showed us this morning, Marcus. <laughs> Get, getting all those so it's in our head memorized, cached, instead of using a wonder algorithm. And uh, it looks kind of like this. And I'll show you that, too. So it randomly generates two numbers, and then it asks you. And you get a little prompt at the bottom here. And then if you get it right, the cat meows at you. <laughs> if you get it wrong, you get a cowbell, which seems totally backwards to me. But this is not my program. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I'm just training her for the, for the real world. So here's her program. And we grew it piecemeal uh, with a little advice from me at the end. But we started, so let's just start with the canned, you know, pick a couple numbers. And let's say there were seven and five. And I just had her, well, she, she knows how to do this already. She knows how to prompt the user and just say, what is seven times five? And then she found the ask and wait. Uh, and then I showed her how to use the, the answer one. She knew how to use the if and else and all this stuff. So she basically just put all this stuff in there. And then I said, OK, that's great. Now we got one, we've got one that asks you seven times five and expects that answer. Let me show you how to generalize that. And again, as we discussed earlier, variables are a bit of a tricky concept to get across at first. So it was a little bit of sitting down and talking about this. And this is where we're starting to see some holes in the abstraction, too, because we set A to this random number. We set B to this random number. This is not really a cat doing things. This is really Scratch doing things. And so the, the abstraction is starting to fall apart a little bit. But still, um, once we were past that little bump in the learning curve, she put this together very fluidly and then used it to practice her multiplication facts. Again, supplemented by lots of other stuff, homework and practicing with us. So I don't know how much credit the program gets for improving her math scores. but I'd like to think some. And so that's the, like, the next big cool thing is that this program meant a lot more to her than just solving a puzzle out of a book, although again, that's fun too, because it solved a real need that she had. And so from there, we've done other Scratch projects too. There's this really cool book called Super Scratch Adventure. And this works you through. It, it's kind of in that tradition of you know, learn you some Haskell, uh, or sorry, learn you some Erlang, learn you a Haskell for great good. It walks you through a story. In every chapter, there's a, a chapter from a comic book and then an exercise to do at the end to get the hero, Scratchy the Cat, out of whatever situation it is. And sometimes you're moving Scratchy around the board, or sometimes you're actually building up a video game. It's a lot of fun. We're not all the way through the book. The exercises are a pretty big step forward in complexity from what we've been building so far. And again, Scratch has that really big palette of available choices. So it's really great for just getting ideas out there and moving characters around and making them react to each other. But it's a little harder for problem solving. It's a little harder for saying, OK, gosh, where do I start? I've got this whole palette of tools. I need to get to you know, my solution here. And this gets uh, to one of the most overused cliches in conference presentations. And I'm proud to share it with you today, the Dreyfus model of skills acquisition, <laughs> which is not a researcher claiming this is exactly how people learn, but simply claiming this is a useful way for us to think about how people learn. But the premise is simply that as time goes on, and as we progress from novice all the way to, to mastery, that we tend to use the phrase mad skills more often, as you can <laughs> clearly see from this chart. But Dreyfus's point was that uh, different 
people at different stages of the learning curve need different things. So somebody who is familiar with programming already just wants you know, give me the syntax reference manual, show me what the show me the API docs, I'll figure the rest out from there. Novices need something different. They need full-on recipes, right? And that's you saw that's kind of how we started. Edit these lines of this file, or drag this icon here and drag that icon there. And at some point, you have to turn them loose. But it's that process of getting from a recipe to a process for getting to a solution that's the, the sort of next big step in the story. And that story has a very strong connection to Open Source Bridge. So if you don't mind for a minute, I'd, I'd actually like to, uh, to talk about Egal, uh, because this is you know, the conference that he helped build. And my remote chose right now to fail to connect. So a lot of my strongest memories of Egal are going to Ruby meetups with him and planning conferences with him and watching him hack on Open Conferenceware, the software that, that runs all of Open Source Bridge. And I, I just think it's really fitting that the conference he helped build put the people together for the next chapter in the story and ended up teaching a lot of people to program. And if it weren't for him, that, that might never have happened. Um, and to me, the, the, the moment, uh, certainly when the, the news hit the hardest, when I was trying to find out what, what went on here and I was Googling for him, um, and this was one of the top links that came up, and th this, is, this is where the knife in, hit the heart for me. Um, but again, I, th I think that it's very fitting that this conference that, that he co-founded and helped build and nurture uh, led to some of the really cool things that, that, uh, that we're going to see next. So there was a talk at Open Source Bridge 2010 when we were in the, the art museum by Brett Nelson. And he's a Portland dad who was looking for a way to make easy, an easy programming robotics experience uh, for his kids and the, the, the kids in the class. And he designed this robot called the Babuino bot. And I guess I'll be chained to the lectern. So I'm sure you've heard of Lego Mindstorms, a little publicly programmable. And those are very, very cool, but of course they're a little costly, and if you want to extend them, you have to wait for Lego to come out with new stuff, or their, or their vendors and partners. And he wanted something that anybody could build and extend, and so he had this open source robot plan. The thing was he needed a way to program it. And he found this project uh, called the GoGo Board, which is a Brazilian government-sponsored robot project. And he found their programming environment and made sure that the Babuino bot was compatible with it. And that programming environment is called blocos, which is the, the Portuguese word for blocks. And it's, as we'll see, a very graphical programming environment where, a little bit like Scratch, you clip together different pieces of programs. To me, it's even easier than Scratch. Part of that's the, the number of choices isn't quite as overwhelming. And the way they connect together is a little more obvious. But it was at that conference that I saw this, and I thought, that's really cool. And on a whim, when my company said, hey, we're going to do a Bring Your Kids to Work Day, I wrote to Brett and said, would you mind bringing a few of those bots, and we can let the kids learn how to program them? And he said, sure. And we've done this uh, a few times since then. And uh, so I'd like to talk about some of the, the observations I've seen from that. So here's, here's me. I've got Brett's bot hooked up to an oscilloscope. We make oscilloscopes. So we have to tie it into day job stuff somehow. Um, and then this is Daughter the Smaller actually working on a program. And what we've kind of settled on after doing this a few times now is trying to get a way to nudge the learners toward solving a problem. And we do that by asking lots of questions and gauging their answers. So we start out and we have everybody kind of follow along with us and say, let's clip a, an on puzzle piece into the start piece. And that'll turn the motors on. Let's say we want the robot to go forward and stop. So, okay, well, then I guess we'll need an off. Like, yeah, but if we go on, off, I mean, that's not really going to go far, forward very far. And they get the idea that, oh, I see, we need, to, we need to have a delay. We turn the motor on. We wait for a second. These are, these are tenths of a second in units. And then turn the motors off. And then we say, okay, well, how would you make it turn? And we don't tell them what to do because there, there are a lot of valid answers. You say, well, imagine you're, you're telling a person how to walk, and all they know is how to step with their legs. 
You can tell them to start walking with both your legs and they'll go straight forward. And eventually somebody in the audience says, oh, well, you need to, uh, to walk with just one leg. And you'll turn. Or another, somebody else will say, oh, no, you need to walk forward with one leg and backward with the other leg. Or you need to keep one leg still and walk backward with the other leg. There are a gajillion different ways to do this. And so whatever way they come up with, you know, they encode it into their solution. So here we turn just one motor on and wait for a little bit. And then they have to hold, do, do this whole scientific uh, trial and error discovery because we don't know how, uh, how many tenths of a second will get the robot to turn about 90 degrees. Depends on the robot, depends on the carpet, depends on uh, which method of turning they chose. So now they're turned loose all over the floor, changing the value, trying it again, and it's, it's really exciting to see. And after a while, you know, they get a right turn. We say, now, let's see. Let's, let's make a square next. Do we add another on and another weight and another? Imagine you're telling a person how to do this. And that's when somebody chimes up and says, well, I would just tell them to do it four times. I say, yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, we show them how to take the, ex the existing program they had and then clip it into a repeat block. And then from here, they, they go off script uh, by design, right? We say, all right, that's, that's the end of the, the, the pre-programmed section of, of this chapter. Go and have fun. And they make the robots do crazy dances and forward, backward, left, right. Uh, some of the older kids will ask if I can name, let's say, a dance step and have the robot do that dance step over again. So they've discovered procedures without us ever prompting them. And uh, it's really cool. So this is all kind of prefab choreography stuff. But uh, at some point, we'd like to interact with our environment. And so we, we show them that this thing has an infrared sensor on the front, and you can read it. And we walk them through building about the simplest interactive program that you can build with one of these things of waiting for an amount of time based on the value read from the sensor, and then beeping, and doing that forever. So it builds kind of a reverse Geiger counter. You know, the closer your, your hand gets, the slower the beeps get. And uh, once they know how to do that, and again, we kind of turn them loose. And some of the older kids, some of the, let's say, fifth graders, are saying, ooh, I want to make it go up to the wall and then stop. Or I want to make it chase me. And so now uh, we're just kind of tech support hanging back. And they're going off and doing stuff like this where if, if the sensor is less than 100, that means there's nothing within a couple feet, and they can keep the wheels going clockwise. Otherwise, something's getting close, better run the wheels backwards. So now you've got a robot that will advance and chase you until it gets too close, and if you take a step toward it, it'll start backing away from you. Or they'll turn on one motor and try to you know, back around an obstacle and then try again. Yes? Uh, at that moment, how giddy were you? <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> And of course, you know, like, Brett's the one that did all this stuff. I'm sure what he felt was, was like, you know, 10 times, because you know, he's the guy that designed this robot, and now he's seeing this whole class full of people do it. And so we, we get from, you know, can, can you help me build this to, hey, come over and look at this. Now we're not tech support anymore, barring a couple of minor questions. Now it's like, I want you to come over and see this thing. And it's just, it, it's so awesome. And uh, I think part of it, is that Blokos lends itself well to that. I, there's something about just having that simple palette and having that almost impossible to make a syntax error environment that gets them in that mindset. But I think there's something else to it there because simplicity by itself is not enough. And what I mean by that is that when we're trying to tell them, okay, you've got this idea in your head, you're talking me through what you want the robot to do. You want it to go forward, you want it to wait, you want it to turn. How do we get that into code? Simplicity by itself doesn't really get you anything. And more on that, the author of Mindstorms, that the LEGO Mindstorm robots are named after, Seymour uh, Peppert, who invented the LOGO programming language back in 67, talked about this, talked about the phenomenon of shooting too much for simplicity in a pro programming language above all other goals. And he was picking on basic here. <laughs> like, did I, this is the language I, I cut my teeth on. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, and so like to us, but I think we're kind of like predisposed toward programming. To, to us, it's like, yeah, basic does look really simple and easy. Well, it's, it's simple to learn the keywords and what they do, but at some point, the program gets bigger and more complicated or gets unwieldy and hard to, it doesn't support that mental structure of getting to your goal. And uh, that's kind of what he's getting at with this. So the alternative, right, is logo. 
And so Logo originally, or at least one of the early or incarnations, controlled a physical, actual robot running around on the floor with, with a pen. And there was something, uh, I, I, this is like the third time I've mentioned Marcus's talk. I think you get a commission if I mention you again. <laughs> Marcus, there. Um, there was something in your talk about uh, body awareness. And uh, uh, Pepper is very aware of this in his uh, writing and, and knows that having seen the kids program this robot that's actually physically moving around on the floor, debugging it by retracing its steps and going, okay, now I told it to turn left and actually getting their body involved in the computation was hugely, hugely powerful. And then vector displays came along and the, and the, uh, the turtle was now no longer a robot but just a triangle on the screen. Well, at least now we can afford the pixels for something that looks like a turtle. <laughs> but what he said was that Logo supports conversation about thinking. It supports this whole idea that we've been talking about, about going, oh, I, I need it to do this, and then I need it to do this, about breaking a problem down. And he, you know, I just kind of thought it was coincidence or the fact that they, they cared to build it that way, but they've, they've been researching this for a long time, and that's why Logo has that feel to it. Uh, the big key insight here was the code is speech, right? It's text. It's something that you can say out loud to your computer. So we figured, why not? So I grabbed a logo interpreter and used my computer's built-in speech to text, sat down, daughter the elder said, hit the function key twice and say forward 100. <laughs> and she did, and it detected it perfectly, actually. And, uh, and I said, okay, now, now press command enter. And then do the next command. And like the turtle moved and responded. I'm like, now do it again. So here she is dictating an entire square. I'm like, that's really cool. But what she did next really floored me because it couldn't have been a better segue into the next piece of the abstraction. She typed in, or, or rather said this, spiral. It's like, makes sense. You made a square, now make a spiral. And she's like, well, it doesn't know how to do that. I'm like, you're going to teach it. And she drew a spiral on a piece of paper. This is the actual spiral that she drew. And then I, I added these little dots and said, OK, let's pretend just for simplification, because I'm intellectually lazy, that it's just really a bunch of straight lines stuck together. You know how to tell the turtle what to do. How would you tell the turtle to do this? And she'd say, well, we'll start with a forward. And I said, OK, and you, you know what a right angle is. It's 90 degrees. To me, this looks like about a third of that. What do, what do you think? And she says, yeah, that's, that looks like about a 30. So she said, all right. I'll do a forward, forward 100 and a right 30. And you know, I said, well, the next one looks like it's a little less to me. And she said, yeah, let's try, let's try 75 and another right 30 and so on and so forth. And uh, then she, at one point, she didn't like the result and said, ah, I don't know, can we go back? I'm like, I don't know, can you? <laughs> and so here she is retracing her steps, quite literally retracing her steps in the program, which I thought was so cool, because I, I didn't even bring up the topic of debugging or walking away through it. She just did it. And uh, started going around some more. At some point, I expected her to say, boy, I'm getting tired of this. I'd like to abstract this. But uh, I, I said, you know, aren't you getting tired of saying this over and over? She's like, no way. This is fun. It's doing what I tell it. <laughs> like, unlike my sister, you know. <laughs> so, but eventually, I said, can I show you another thing? She said, sure. So I said, wouldn't it be nice to, to say, well, we're doing this same thing all the time, and we're doing mostly the same thing here, we're just changing the amount. You know, we, can, we can do that a little more automatically. But I said, we need a name. We need to know what to call this amount. She said, let's, let's call it distance. And I said, OK, dictate this. M make distance 100. And then I said, sorry about this. Also, you have to add a quote mark here. I really don't like that feature of this logo implementation. Uh, a, a more classical logo, I don't believe you have to do that. But uh, she had to type one extra character. But was able to dictate the sentence, and then NASA, NASA said, OK, what, what do you think you're going to try next? Well, of course, forward distance. And then it's time to shrink the distance a little bit. We just picked 90%. That seemed reasonable. So now she's highlighting and running this section of code over and over again, not actually redictating it. And eventually, we get a nice little spiral. And I'm sure you can guess what's coming next. We're getting tired of rerunning this code. 
So now introducing the concept of loops, I don't know how I tricked her into saying the word repeat, but at, at some point it's like, yep, that's the word for it. Now say repeat 20 and wrap that around your program with some square brackets, and she did. And then the last step was to give this thing a name, which of course she picked the name first when we started. In a classical logo environment, you would type to spiral, and then you would type in your program, and then you would say end. I'm not quite sure why this one seems to require a dialog box, but it's not the end of the world. You fire up the dialog box, you paste in your code, you give it a name, and now she can run that program that she had designed earlier, spiral. So what do you think she did next? <laughs> and then she did it again and again and again and said, wow, I keep, I keep typing it in. It keeps, uh, yeah, it's like the, like the old spirograph. It keeps, do, it keeps uh, staying in this track of three. And I said, well, what multiple of 90 degrees did we use? And of course, it also has to do with how many times we, we ran around the line segment. But basically, we're at a nice integral multiple of 360 here, right? What if you didn't want to, and she, she said, well, can we, can we have it not do that? I'm like, well, yeah. Can, can you think of a number that doesn't go into 360 quite as well? So we changed the angle. And now when she runs it, it goes off up here. She says, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you keep running it and see? And eventually, you know, it comes right back around. And then she said this. <laughs> And uh, we were able to use the built-in speech synthesis in this logo interpreter and have it actually say that out loud. At least it wasn't a poop joke. Yes, at least it wasn't a poop joke. <laughs> Give him time. So meanwhile, uh, so her little sister wanted to draw a shape too. OK, what do you want to draw? Well, I want to draw a robot. OK, well, what's a robot look like? Oh, like this. This is the robot that she drew. So that now we're talking about a lot of jumping around and absolute positioning. We're not talking about that, that sweet spot of logo programming, of moving around. So I didn't have any illusions that, that we're going to you know, get into the intricacies of jumping random access memory sort of around the screen. But I decided to take one baby step towards that. I said, OK, I'll do a quick graph paper here, and I'm going to try to recreate your robot. Is this kind of like the robot you want to draw? She said, yes. I said, OK. She knew how to draw the square. You know, she, we'd seen that. I said, now we need to draw the mouth part, but we need to tell the, the, the uh, turtle to go over here. So how many squares over is that? And she counted, went, OK, that's three squares over. I said, OK, how many squares up is that? That's two. OK, and how many squares long is it? Well, that's five. So we repeated this exercise for all the parts of the drawing. So this is neat, because we're not really talking about problem solving or drawing a robot. We're sneaking in a lesson about Cartesian coordinates, which <laughs> She's not going to remember tomorrow, but that's OK, because it's fun anyway. And this whole like, phenomenon of sneaking in an extra lesson that was like beside the point of the lesson you thought you were going to teach him was uh, Randy Pausch calls this the head fake. Randy Pausch, who wrote uh, the last lecture. So we can teach people things by stealth, right? <laughs> and, and so that was another, even though I've heard this quote before and, and absolutely love that speech, if you ever get the chance to go uh, listen to it, uh, the, the last lecture, it's, it's on YouTube. It's fantastic, and I'd heard this before and been steeped in this idea, but it still gets me when I get to see it happen. It's like, oh, cool, she's, she's learning math. I'm not going to tell her. <laughs> and uh, so then we actually put it together. Now, the dictation doesn't work as well for five-year-olds. I mean, she speaks really well, but the software is just not calibrated for it. And so you know, she says forward 100, and it says correct horse battery staple. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then that unlocks my, my one password, and you know, she's, she's in all my sites. But um, we, could, we could do this through two-stage dictation, where she would say it to me, and then I would repeat it or type it. So it kind of sort of works, right? But we, we started with the basic square. And then I had to do this stuff because, again, this is not really the sweet spot of logo. I suppose we could have done relative positioning or, or done the trig, Marcus, to, to uh, <laughs> figure out exactly how many pixels to go here. But, I just wanted to get the basics of we're going to go over three and up two, just like you told me when we were looking at your notebook. And that was, that was enough of the Cartesian lesson for the day. But one thing, she said, well, hey, it's not right. I'm like, yeah, I know. What's up with that? And, she's, and so I, I pulled out a pencil, and I said, let's pretend we're the turtle. And I started to say, OK, we go forward and go this way. And then we go to here, and then we go to here. And she says, oh, you're not supposed to draw those parts. Like, 
OK, so we have to tell the turtle not to draw those parts. So now we have to add a pen up and a pen down call around them. And lo and behold, now we have her robot. And this, this whole experiment with the two of them was, uh, couldn't have been more than like half an hour of just sitting down. They'd never seen the environment before, never written a logo program. And, and here they are uh, drawing pictures, especially like Dot of the Elder discovering procedures and spirals and all this kind of cool stuff. And the other cool punchline that, that I like about logo and about learning to program is that uh, Blokos that we saw a few minutes ago is actually just a logo implementation. Uh, when you write a program in Blokos, it is actually generating text source code behind the scenes in logo, feeding that to a byte compiler, <laughs> and, and sending that down to the Atmel chip that runs on the, the robot. Uh, and then a bucket, uh, a boot kicks a bucket over, and the water spills, and it scares the cat. <laughs> So I feel like this dictation thing is kind of hitting this sweet spot. And I, I don't know that this is universal, but I know that we're a really talky family. And so I think that may be why this seems to have been a good fit for us. Because you get people talking about, well, yeah, how, how, do you, how would you tell you know, this, this concrete friend of ours, the turtle that we can actually now see, or the robot on the floor, right? How would you tell it to go and do something? It seems a lot more concrete and easily realizable than this abstract, oh, let's, let's talk about algorithms and heuristics and problem solving. And so I think that's why it seems to work for us, this whole notion of talking it out and then letting that process of discussing it be part of the solution. And then if they can come along and solve a real world need with it, that'd be awesome too. So you'll notice that the tools that involve discussion and reasoning out the problem are, have, we've been using just to build more silly and fun stuff, and the tools that they've built to solve real world problems are the big serious wall of text, wall of tools. I don't yet know of a tool that really combines those two approaches. Maybe there's a fantastic API for logo for, for rendering GUIs or something, but uh, that would be a really neat next step to see. But in the meantime, uh, I just want to really share my gratitude for this conference and for all of you, and if it weren't for Open Source Bridge, There'd be a lot of kids that never, would have never programmed a robot, who had never started that journey learning to program. Who, who knows what they're all going to go do with their lives and careers. But uh, I feel really, really lucky to have been here in the right place at the right time to have gotten exposed to part of it and gotten to, to sort of be part of it. And I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of the conference. Thanks for coming, and uh, cheers. So pu public funding for, uh, for developing a project like that? Yeah. I, th I think it would be fantastic. It, it's uh, certainly inspired by a publicly funded project, because the GoGo -Go board that inspired it was, a, was funded by Brazil. And uh, part of the reason that, that Brett wanted to go with his own approach rather than the repurpose in the GoGo -Go was the GoGo -Go was like, oh, yes, it's easy to build your own robot. Step one, etch the circuit board as follows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it's, it was something that anybody could do as long as they had access to the right dangerous chemicals. Uh, um, and uh, so he wanted something you could just go to Radio Shack and get a circuit board and solder things down. Soldering is within the reach of, of first timers, much more so than. Are the robot parts printed from like a rep wrap or? Oh, that would be awesome. I, 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 think, I think you win the prize. Do, do, you, do you ever do any Ruby or Cucumber? Sometimes. Okay, would, would you like the prize? I think that's fantastic. Um, so this is the, the new book. I need to cover the mic. Uh, that um, Matt Wynn and Aslak Hellsoy and I wrote about, uh, about using cucumber. For the, uh, for the rest of you, it's available on pragprog.com. Anyway, um, I think it'd be fantastic to be able to just download a recipe and, and actually print some of these parts. Uh, there's still a lot of handwork involved in, in shaping You'll notice the body of the robot was made from a, a political campaign sign. <laughs> yes, that's, that's the best use of them, really. Let's see if. The, yes, the wheels are styrofoam. And this one, surprisingly, 
doesn't have, he usually puts a pair of heavy duty rubber bands around them to get a little more traction. Yeah, so political lawn sign here, um, standard um, like model car or train motors or something like that, the cheapest stepper motors he could find. Circuit board and parts from Radio Shack, and then he, he gets these Atmel chips, the same ones that go in the Arduino uh, in bulk from DigiKey or somewhere. So I th the robot ends up being around 35 or 40 bucks, I think. So I'm going to repeat that so we get on the audio. So you, you said uh, the ADA, uh, oh sorry, was it SparkFun? Or was it? It was just a robot kit that I had around. Oh, a robot kit that you had when you were younger. And like it was, you said laser cut and then you kind of tied it all together? That's awesome. Oh, pool noodles for the wheels. <laughs> yeah. And you can make uh, those actually make pretty good wheels. And then what we've been doing for bearings is if you stick two various sizes in, you get friction, but you get enough of them, you can actually make amazingly smooth bearings that way. Make a bearing out of a pool noodle? Wow. Um, so it's like bearings within bearings, or you know, multi, what's it called? Uh, Multi-stage rolling contact. Okay, I'm not going to try to repeat, repeat all that for this. For those playing along with our home game, talk to Marcus Roberts to, to, to learn how to build bearings out of uh, pool noodles. So a foam board from, from the grocery store for yeah. rapid prototyping. Yeah. Excellent. Doesn't cost as much as a 3D printer does. Okay. Can we make sure we get that on camera? Oh, yeah. So this is Sam's uh, foam board keyboard case. Very cool. Are you an attorney, Marcus? <laughs> okay, so sign company dumpsters. You're, you're a local law permitting. Yeah. No. Yes. Oh, okay. This friend of yours goes dumpster diving, is what you're saying. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone.